I'm very honored to be here uh, to share a lot of what we've done over the last decade with you and kind of uh, my ideas and thoughts about uh, the path forward. And so um, uh, I think we have about an hour. I'll try to I, I put up quite an ambitious amount of information in this talk and hopefully we'll be able to end relatively early. If I do breeze through a little bit, it's because I want to leave time for questions and discussions because I'd really love to learn uh, from you uh, through your uh, inquiries. So here's some uh, standard disclosures around uh, research funding and salary support. So <clears throat> communication, we hear about it all the time. Uh, you know, it's, it's hammered home constantly uh, during medical training, uh, surgical training, et cetera. Uh, so what, really, what's the current state of communication in surgery? And we'll talk, touch a little bit on then kind of my views. And some of this will just be very clinical vignette based where you'll, you'll recognize these situations and know uh, or, or uh, understand that you've been in these situations before. Failure to rescue, as Peter described, is really something I have worked on for the last decade, but I describe it as my straw man for understanding communication and quality in healthcare and surgery in particular. And then we'll talk a little bit about kind of where we can go uh, toward the future. So here's an excellent quote from George Bernard Shaw. The, the, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And we recognize this on a day in and day out basis. Think about the, the sheer volume of information that you're communicating uh, across uh, providers, clinicians, uh, et cetera, within the hospital. Um, we, we say something and we assume everybody has, understands it. We write something in the electronic medical record or the paper chart and we assume everybody who needs to know knows. And so truly, uh, uh, you know, um, the goal here is to close that loop and understand that uh, communication is a lot more than just uh, uh, written or, or verbal. <coughs> So here's a patient in ICU uh, in Michigan uh, who, um, I'll tell you a little vignette about this patient, and, and we'll come back to this patient toward the end of the talk. This is a 71-year-old patient who underwent a, a subtotal gastrectomy for cancer uh, with a ruin wire reconstruction. The patient ended up developing a leak, was in the ICU, um, doing fairly okay, uh, but required a procedure in our interventional radiology suite. And because of his tenuous state, was going to require uh, an anesthesia transport, is how we describe it. So it was going to require some higher level of transport. And the anesthesiologist come up to the surgical intensive care unit, oftentimes intubate the patient, take him back down uh, for the procedure, and then bring him back up and extubate. Sounds very routine, right? Uh, we'll get to a lot of the flaws in this case that actually led uh, to this patient dying as we move forward. But just remember, Something as simple as we're going to go up to the ICU, intubate, very routine, take him down to the, uh, to the interventional radiology suite and come back. Remember this patient. So I, I found this a very interesting. Now, I study communication mostly in the post-operative setting. Uh, but I, I've taken on a new role in the last year, kind of understanding uh, and improving quality and culture and efficiency, et cetera, within, within the operating rooms. And this is uh, an eye-opening study about communication within the operating room. Do you all do timeouts in the operating room, right? Yep, it, you know, those checklists have been rammed down our throats for a while now. Um, and they seem like they would make sense that they would do good. But part of the problem is they become rote. Um, and people don't pay as much attention to the quality or content of the, the, the timeout. And one of the pieces, if, if yours is similar to ours, is the very first thing you do is introduce everybody in the operating room, right? Um, this was a very interesting study where they polled everybody in the OR at the end of the case to see who knew the other people's names. <laughs> and I would draw your attention, if for nothing else, to this box right here. You would think the surgical attending, SA, would know his or her surgical resident, their name. <laughs> they got it right only 68% of the time. That's, I mean, pathetic is maybe a little overstatement, but that's pretty sad. But this is the current state of communication in healthcare. We don't, we don't pay as much attention uh, as we need to. And, and some places have uh, really led this effort with uh, scrub caps with their people's names on the front. I don't know if you do that here. Uh, we are actually doing that at Michigan now because of this. Um, I really do think that a lot of communication, subtle or otherwise, um, is, is withheld, is held back because I'm embarrassed because I don't remember your name. I don't want to call you, hey, you. Uh, I don't want to say, hey, anesthesia. Um, so if it's not super important, I'll let it slide. But you can imagine you know, death by a thousand cuts in the operating room. If, if that is continuing to happen, uh, we're going to have balls dropped. So 
here's the ideal situation, right? We have nurses, doctors, physios, everybody coming together, talking to each other, um, and this is really the ideal state in healthcare. I would describe this as a unicorn. Um, you don't see this anywhere. Um, multidisciplinary kind of conferences don't count. I'm talking about day-to-day -day management of patients. Uh, I challenge you to find a ward anywhere uh, where everybody comes together, sits down, really kind of puts their heads together as they're um, uh, uh, trying to come up with a diagnosis or um, treat their patients. So I really feel like this is a unicorn. What's really happening is usually this nowadays. Um, you've got a care team in the background trying to figure out, as a doctor back there, trying to figure out what's going on. And then you've got other people distracted by their smartphones or, you know, hey, I already entered the vital sign data, they can figure it out. I mean, this is really kind of this idea of the separation of powers on the units. The hierarchy we're trying to flatten is fine, but the communication isn't necessarily occurring the way it should because, again, a lot of what we do, now they're holding a paper chart, it's pretty archaic. I shouldn't say that. Do you guys have paper charts? Okay, sorry. How to put your, <laughs> I also teach a class how to put your foot in your mouth 101. Um, so, so, but you know, we think about even the electronic medical record as being um, uh, the panacea of communication in healthcare. And as we know, in our experience, it's a lot of cutting and pasting um, and very minimal important content. Not to mention, it doesn't really, it, you, don't, you, you, would, you wouldn't text uh, the things you write uh, in the uh, medical record. There's, there's a bit of formality in the medical record that loses some of the nuance of communication. So then we have some communication that occurs and we have you know, physicians fighting and yelling and uh, we see this uh, mostly between departments. Uh, if we've got consultants, uh, and I, consultant for me is something different. So if you've got a consulting physician, so if I'm a surgical attending and I've got infectious disease, gastroenterology, uh, and we all have different views on how the patient should be managed, um, unfortunately some of this has devolved into conflict that's become even more difficult uh, and the communication occurs through passive aggressive uh, notes in the uh, electronic <coughs> medical record as opposed to I think this is actually probably somewhat therapeutic to just get it all out there. Um, uh, but again, this can contribute to even uh, worse communication. So I'm, I'm painting kind of a relatively negative picture because I really do think that communication in healthcare is, is, is not where it should be. And these are just some, uh, some concepts that uh, many of you probably, uh, that resonate with you. So let's get some data out there. So the Joint Commission uh, is basically the accrediting body for hospitals in the United States. And um, here are, so all Sentinel events need to be reported to the Joint Commission and they undergo a root cause analysis. And you see here that communication is in the top three every year uh, as a root cause of Sentinel events um, in healthcare. <coughs> Um, so, you know, other things up there that uh, you all have uh, heard uh, from Peter's group and others uh, around human factors, leadership, et cetera, are up there. But, you know, we know that communication uh, is really the linchpin to improving um, a lot or preventing a lot of these sentinel events. So what are the solutions we've come up with? Well, that's easy, right? We come up with checklists. So that, you know, of course, that's like the, the gold standard for communication. Uh, in nursing, uh, we use, in the United States, we use something called SBAR. Uh, it's basically a structured communication tool. Um, ICUs now have these daily goal sheets that, have, that are supposed to have uh, clear communication. So standardization makes some sense. For team behaviors, uh, many of you heard of Team Steps, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality uh, put together this uh, comprehensive uh, plan for how you can improve culture and team building. Um, and so, you know, that's a, a, a decent solution. Um, technology, you know, we talked about the EMR. What about smartphones, right? So um, do you all carry one-way pagers? Or do you, how do you guys communicate? Do you have paging, a paging system or anything of that sort? Or does it go to your, does it go to your smartphones? No. Um, so we still have one-way pagers that, uh, it's pretty funny because when some of our patients who are of the new generation see us with those, they, they thought those were extinct. Um, because what, why would you want just unidirectional communication? Um, there is no way of closing a loop. And in a lot of uh, adverse events, they're like, well, I didn't get the page. And then that's it, I'm off the hook. Uh, we have technology out there. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, hospitals in the US now that are using proprietary software that is uh, you know, privacy compliant that allows for two-way communication using smartphones. So, so what's the problem with these approaches, though? I mean, if, if these were the solutions, they all sound reasonable, we would have perfect communication, is that they take a one-size-fits-all approach. They don't take into consideration the context within which uh, we are delivering care. And it's supposed to be the same for the medical physicians as well as the surgeons. It's supposed to be the same on the ward as it is on the ICU. Um, it's supposed to be the same inpatient, outpatient. 
So clearly this one size approach, uh, fits all approach is not gonna work. And so to better understand these nuances of communication, uh, we need a case study. And that's where failure to rescue comes in. I think it's, it's something that you can describe to your grandmother, your grandfather. Um, it's, it totally makes sense. Patient has a complication. Uh, I'll get into description in a second, but you know, we fail to rescue them. Uh, why? You know? uh, so here's, here's an overly simplistic view of a surgical episode. Right? Patient has an operation. They may develop a seminal complication. Could be something as simple as a urinary tract infection, uh, DVT. Uh, if it's not detected, it can lead to domino complications. We've all seen those patients, right? Starts with one little thing and then it just the dominoes continue to fall and then they may succumb to that. And so for probably uh, the latter part of the 90s and early 2000s, you know, the goal was if we were going to reduce mortality after surgery, we had to prevent complications. A lot of initiatives around making sure antibiotics were given on time, DVT prophylaxis was administered appropriately, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we did a good job of that. Uh, I think you know, we got compliance rates in the United States upwards of 90% for a lot of these process measures. Um, but we weren't re realizing the, the benefits uh, uh, fully uh, for mortality reduction. So rescue kind of flips it on its head a little bit and says, okay, you know, things are gonna happen. The adverse outcomes are gonna happen. You have the 70-year-old obese diabetic male who comes in for an operation. Yeah, they're gonna have a really high likelihood of developing a superficial surgical site infection, right? Uh, the question is, do you detect it and treat it, or do you allow it to become an organ space infection bec and because you haven't uh, treated it? And so this idea of rescuing is really preventing these seminal complications from uh, uh, leading to a domino effect. So, how do we get this on the map? This was actually initially described in 1992 uh, by a pediatric anesthesiologist, uh, but was kind of uh, a term and a quality measure that was obscure in the literature, and a lot of people did not know um, about it, especially in surgery. Part of the critique around it was that it was using administrative data, so that the complications were not uh, fully, uh, were not reliable. So in 2009, uh, with two of my colleagues, Drs. Berkmeyer and Dimmick, we uh, gained access to uh, the NSQIP data um, in the US, and this was early on um, in the NSQIP experience where there was only about 100 hospitals. Now there's over uh, five, 600 hospitals that participate. And the beauty of this data was that it was ner clinical nurse abstracted data. So the complications, everything was very reliable. So there was no argument anymore that you know, your data is unreliable so you can't make uh, uh, judgment, judgments or can't uh, make any conclusions about how uh, failure to rescue mortality and complications are related. So when we use this high quality data, we, we took hospitals, we divided them into quintiles uh, five equal groups uh, rated by their uh, risk-adjusted mortality. And you could see, even in this kind of select cohort of large academic medical centers in the United States, there was a two-fold variation in mortality following major surgery. Um, so this is interesting in and of itself, but we know variation exists everywhere. But the key was understanding the relationship between failure to rescue and complications. This had been described, uh, again, by Sil Jeff Silver and others, um, in administrative data, but this is the first time we were using clinical data to describe this. And what we found was those same quintiles of mortality had very similar rates of uh, both uh, uh, all complications or uh, major or significant complications. And what really distinguished their uh, differences between them as far as their mortality was this concept of rescue. And rescue is really, uh, mathematically, is the case fatality rate of major complications. And so this seems uh, very kind of obvious now, but at the time, in 2009, really caught the attention of people in the United States, um, and especially surgical departments that then suddenly began to pay attention to this measure. Now again, it had been around. Um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in 2003 adopted it as a quality measure and reported it. After our study, the, uh, our, hosp our national um, Medicare program began to report this um, on their website, and you can actually log on now and look up any hospital and see, uh, here's University of Michigan Health System, kind of see where do they, uh, are they above, below, or at uh, the national rate for rescue. And then the National Quality Forum, which really drives a lot of the agendas in, in the United States, had endorsed this from 2008 to 2017, and recently withdrew endorsement, mainly because uh, people like Medicare were using administrative data to report this, and they felt that there was a reliability issue. They endorsed the the concept, 
uh, but not the way it was being measured. But nonetheless, there are a lot of people who um, have begun to pay attention to this, and it has sparked some interest in how do we reduce it, right? So whenever you're measured on something and it's reported, how do you improve it? Well, this is where uh, some interest in organizational systems and design really um, uh, took off. So as a, uh, so I was a research fellow, I forgot to mention that, in 2009 when I uh, wrote that paper. And um, in the ensuing four to five years, uh, basically we tried to understand every macro system level characteristic that was associated with failure to rescue, trying to unpack it and understand it using secondary data or large data sets. And we looked at things like hospital volume, you know, teaching status, uh, hospital technology levels, nurse to patient ratios, et cetera. And we found some interesting solutions, or excuse me, associations, but there were no solutions there. Many of the things I just described to you are, are fixed. I mean, nurse to patient ratios may be a little bit movable, but um, you ask any hospital leader, it's not like there's an infinite amount of money to keep hiring more and more nurses, right? So yes, it'd be great if every patient had one-to-one -one nursing, that's just not gonna happen. So one of my friends at the time, and she's still my friend, uh, but she didn't tell me that, she's a trauma surgeon in Houston, she didn't tell me she was gonna write this. So, you know, we were, you know, this is one of my research fellows, uh, again, there's Dimmick and Berkmeyer, and we wrote this paper, you know, thinking about, he was, he's uh, now a vascular surgeon, was interested in cardiovascular surgery, and um, nobody had really described fairly rescue that. So, okay, great, we'll write this fun paper for him. It was a chance for him to learn how to write and analyze data. Um, but Lillian called me out in, nationally, publicly on this and said, look, enough is enough. You've written umpteen papers about this. What are you gonna do about it? Thank you. Um, so, you know, you, you try to take inspiration from that. And so we did, and we decided to take this, you know, kind of, very simplistic view, and begin to kind of add some pieces around and start building a conceptual model around what are some things that we can study, some aspects of this that we can study in a rigorous way. So we applied for funding through the National Institute for Aging and received funding to really understand two big two pieces, um, microsystem level resources that may affect uh, the ability to recognize and respond to complications, as well as this concept of kind of teamwork or safety attitudes uh, within uh, uh, health systems. So uh, here's uh, what we did. We went to 32 uh, hospitals in the state of Michigan um, that participate in a large quality collaborative there that has clinically abstracted data. And um, so that's where we uh, garnered uh, this FTR data and the mortality data. You can see within these uh, 32 hospitals, again, it's very similar to the, the national population. About a two-fold difference in failure to rescue. Um, this was we picked uh, kind of higher risk operations. Um, you know, twofold risk. So, so this, this is very consistent from the uh, worst to the best performers. But what we then did was we began to look at these microsystem level uh, factors, right? So ICU staffing is, is the one that I'll talk about. We at the time knew, and Peter Pronovos had really kind of pioneered a lot of this in writing about closed ICUs, which uh, in the US a closed ICU essentially means you have a board certified intensivist um, who manages the day-to-day events uh, for patients and writes the orders and you know, takes care of all that. And the surgical team is really kind of the ones that are consulting on the patient, just providing input from a surgical perspective and pathophysiology as far as feeding, et cetera. And so um, at the time in the state of Michigan, you could see, I mean, overall, there was probably about a 45% rate of uh, closed ICUs. But it, it, it held true that hospitals that were better at rescue um, had more closed ICUs. It made sense, right? So this is actually a relatively easy thing to flip a switch on. You hire an intensivist, it's, it's not that difficult as opposed to other things like you know, trying to uh, hire more nurses or trying to improve or in increase your hospital technology, or et cetera, et cetera. So, so this sparked another interesting question. In my era, uh, it dawned on me the other day as, as a was a medical student uh, here in the UK who was visiting us d here, right? Yeah, so um, who, um, uh, came to spent a year with us to do some research and was interested in unpacking this idea of intensivist staffing and, and how that affects mortality within hospitals. And so there's a little bit of kind of nuance here as far as the, the statistical methodology that we employed here. There had been innumerable papers written about the benefits of uh, ICU, uh, closed ICUs or intensivists, but the flaw there was that there was a lot of pre-post evaluations, meaning it was they looked at before there was intensivists and after there was intensivists, uh, in aggregate, and they saw, yeah, of course, you know, places where there was intensivists did better. I mean, that was undeniable. 
The question was, if you are, as an individual hospital, looking at your outcomes over time, and you hire an intensivist, do you see an improvement in your specific outcomes? Sure, some people had seen that. But in aggregate, was this true? And so what we found, uh, we used this econometric technique called difference in differences. And in this technique, we're able to remove what we describe as secular trends. And what does that mean? We know healthcare in general is getting safer. So we know in general, mortality rates from 30 years ago after major surgery were higher than mortality rates currently. If we just look at 0 .0 30 years ago and say there was no intensivists and look at now, oh yeah, of course, the intensivists led to improved outcomes. But when you remove that trend over time of improvement, you begin to unpack different changes. And so in this difference of differences technique, you need a time zero. That's typically a policy change, right? So we, we use this technique a lot in national policy evaluation. But in this situation, we were able to use it as the point at which uh, intensivists were hired at specific hospitals around the country, and we were using Medicare data for this. And you would expect, and we looked at both medical and surgical patients, if this hiring of an intensivist were to lead to improved outcomes, that the moment this is, this is the trend of mortality, you would expect there to be a sharp inflection, or at least some inflection, that that hiring led to improvement. We saw a trend toward the opposite almost in surgical, but really just no significant change. This was kind of eye-opening. And this really helped with my conceptual model around rescue. There is no easy fix. There is no light switch you can flip to improve quality. And I had applied my own experience to this data. When I had uh, arrived at Michigan as a trainee, we had just closed the ICUs. And as an intern, you are you know, very intimately involved with patient care, patients going back and forth from the ICU. And our chair had hired uh, arguably the best uh, intensivist in the country, Lena Napolitano, to come in and close the ICUs and develop a more, much more structured uh, critical care environment. Well, you can imagine she was met with a lot of resistance by many of the senior surgeons who had for many years managed their own patients in the ICU. Um, and so you can see in a maybe a slightly different environment or a different individual that just hiring <coughs> that intensivist, they could be overpowered or kind of just made irrelevant by the surgical services. But in our hospital, our chair uh, resolved any and all conflicts between Dr. Napolitano and the surgeons by saying, Surgeons, you, you're wrong. The intensivist is right. And that was extremely powerful. And that is an example of leadership, of culture. And so you can imagine a lot of places that are hiring intensivists to meet some sort of external benchmark or measure may not be fully invested in providing that individual or individuals uh, the recipe for success. So that's, that was huge. So um, we then looked at safety attitudes more broadly in the state of Michigan. We, we, we looked at the same 32 hospitals, and we applied the safety attitudes questionnaire to those hospitals. And we did this um, in aggregate on surgical units. And the safety attitudes questionnaire, if you're not familiar with it, um, has multiple domains um, that uh, uh, can be reported out off of this. It's probably, I think it's like 50 or 60 questions. And uh, we focus on the top two, teamwork and safety climate. And what we found, interestingly, and I was surprised by this, I thought there'd be a nice association between safety culture and outcomes. Those same uh, three groups of hospitals, uh, low, middle, and high failure to rescue, we found no difference uh, between them with their teamwork climate or safety climate. But one thing that's interesting in this data is that the nurses consistently rated the safety and teamwork climate as worse than their uh, surgeon counterparts. Um, so this is interesting, and this holds true, if you go look at any safety culture data, uh, this holds true consistently. And this gets to the concept of kind of what is the frontline provider actually experiencing versus what is the view uh, from the top. And you know, we sliced, you know, we did the whole salami slicing, we looked at every different uh, question, and again, there was no difference across any, of, any and all of these questions. It was very consistent. Um, across these groups. So I 
was frustrated at this point, and I, I told Lillian, uh, I was like, listen, I don't know what to do. Uh, yeah, I tried, I failed. Um, there's clearly no easy button to improve rescue. There's nothing that I can, uh, no toolkit that I can provide. Um, but at the same time, I um, began to look toward the future and had a fortuitous um, interaction with somebody uh, at our, at our uh, institution. I'm gonna, let me just, this is bad timing, because I just want to put a joke in there, just kind of chill the mood a little bit at the halfway point. Um, I love this cartoon. You may have seen it before, uh, in case you can't see it there in the back, you know, and that is why we lift on three. Uh, they've dropped the patient. They're holding it. So, um, all right, <laughs> tough crowd. Um, so, uh, so, so this is this is where um, that I describe in my mind as the inflection point of understanding rescue. So, uh, Carl Weick and Kathy Sutcliffe uh, really kind of pioneered the concept of high reliability organizations, and I'm sure many of you here are familiar with it. Um, it's become one of uh, the buzzwords in healthcare, um, and I didn't realize that they were Michigan faculty. And that uh, Carl Weick had retired, but Kathy Sutcliffe was alive and well, and um, still continuing to do this research over in the, in the University of Michigan Business School. And so this really sparked a relationship between Kathy and I to understand and apply a lot of the principles in high reliability to what we were trying to do in, in, in failure to rescue. And you know, so, so for those of you who aren't as familiar with high reliability organizations, I mean, the concept is that the capacity for an organization uh, the capacity for organizational resilience is really kind of based on the understanding uh, that the unexpected is going to happen. This gets to that complication idea, right? We can't prevent all complications. They're going to happen. That we know it's inevitable, but uh, we have to uh, build in systems and plan and anticipate uh, uh, what we're going to do once those occur. I know you, you guys do a lot of this work here, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir. Um, so what are some examples of HROs? I mean, everyone always uses nuclear power as one. Um, I think this is my favorite, uh, aircraft carriers. Um, the, I've, I've read a lot about aircraft carriers in, in, the, in the course of my uh, work on understanding HROs. And what you're, just, what you're seeing here, what's interesting, and I'll, I'll describe this, is uh, called unrep, uh, but it's basically replenishment um, of supplies that's occurring between the supply boat and if you've ever played Battleship, that game, yeah, here's the supply bow and here's the battleship. Um, so, um, or the carrier. There, you can see these, these cables attached between these two boats. They're not standing still, as you can see. They're moving at about 12 knots. Uh, don't ask me what that means. I just know they're moving at 12 knots. Um, and what they have to do is this coordinated effort to move supplies across. Now, seems easy enough. Uh, okay, what if it's choppy water? What if uh, this, uh, the captain of this ship falls asleep and starts veering off to the left? You know, again, slight differences uh, can result in catastrophic consequences because if these cords, there's people, you can see here, on the other end of it, if they snap because they move apart, you lose supplies in the water, but you lose people. Those will snap back and kill uh, sailors on both sides. So this is a very coordinated effort that is practiced uh, uh, quite a bit. You can imagine, imagine now this is an operation, right? And the complication is that this, this uh, aircraft carrier starts to slow down a little bit because of some incident. That uh, some incident. Um, if this is not well communicated to the captain of this ship, there are catastrophic consequences to innumerable people. Just think of that as surgery, right? Except this, these are, this is your patient, this is the operation. Something comes, kind of veers off course. If we don't communicate that and recognize it, catastrophic consequences can occur, a patient's death. So here's a, um, now here's a good description from a senior officer uh, from aircraft carrier. I'll just I'll read this quickly. So you want to understand an aircraft carrier. Well, just imagine that it's a busy day and you shrink San Francisco Airport to only one short runway and one ramp and one gate. Make planes take off and land at the same time at half the present time interval, rock the runway from side to side, and require that everyone who leaves in the morning returns that same day. Make sure the equipment is so close to the edge of the envelope that it's fragile. Then, turn off the radar to avoid detection, impose strict controls on radios, fuel the aircraft in place with their engines running, put an enemy in the air, and scatter live bombs and rockets around. Now, wet the whole thing down with seawater and oil and man it with 20-year-olds, half of whom have never seen an airplane up close. Oh, and by the way, try not to kill anyone. 
that's like surgical wards, right? I mean, to some degree. So we think we have it tough because, I mean, you know, we all suffer from the NIH syndrome, not invented here, right? So, like, the concept is, well, this wasn't invented in healthcare, so we're different. We're special. Our environment is just completely, we're not an aircraft here. We're dealing with human beings. These are human beings, too. And I would argue that's a much more complex environment with complex decision-making that's occurring. Um, so we don't get to just throw our hands up in the air and say, we don't know what to do. So you've heard about high reliability organizations. But what Kathy taught me is that it's, it should be more of a verb. It's high reliability organizing. It's not, you don't achieve, because I hear this, people want to achieve high reliability. You don't achieve high uh, uh, in a high reliability organization. You continue high reliability organizing. Um, and what does that mean? There's these five pillars of high reliability organizing. Preoccupation with failure, reluctance to simplify, sensitivity to operations, deference to expertise, and commitment to resilience. I put these up here like this intentionally. The top row you can describe as being important in problem detection, right? Complication detection. The bottom row is really problem management or complication management, right? We have to build these principles into our everyday, not just say that, you know, we achieved it once and now we're good. And so something that we did, I, you know, I tried to apply this idea of high reliability organizing to surgery, and along with Kathy, my postdoc at the time, and Peter Pronovos, we wrote this paper, uh, really kind of more of an opinion piece that's, that has some data behind it. In understanding the three waves of innovation in patient safety, it was mostly in surgery was the, was the, um, was, was really the, venue with which I was writing this, or the backdrop with which I was writing this. And we all know that we've had technical advancements, right? So we've improved the technology around surgery, and we've, we've gained some significant improvements, but I believe we reached kind of a flat of the curve. Now we're just kind of fiddling with robots, right? So uh, I have a point to the urologist. Uh, um, you know, so it, there's certain indications for it, but now we're trying to push the album, and people are doing like inguinal hernia repairs with robots. I find that, does anybody in here do that? Okay, good, I find that crazy. Um, and then, uh, you know, so, so we've reached kind of the flag here. Standardizing procedures, we talked about this. We achieved great strides, I believe, in standardization with checklists and things of that sort, uh, process compliance. But again, we reached a flat of the curve. And really, the third wave, my, believe, my belief that the third wave is this concept of high reliability organizing, something that other industries have done for years and decades, and that we are now just starting to understand and uh, uh, dive into. So uh, I put this up here. I would encourage you to read it. If you want a copy of it, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, not because I wrote it, because I, I really believe in the principles um, we laid forth. So I've got about 18 minutes, uh, to the, or 20 minutes at to the top of the hour, and I've got to try to cut it short. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now um, to improve rescue um, and really improve communication. Uh, we developed this failure to rescue patient safety learning lab uh, that has two big components to it, um, technology and human behavior. It used to say human factors on the right, but I, I appreciate I am not an expert in human factors, so I would be a charlatan if I wrote uh, human factors up there. So behavior is my kind of, uh, you can tell me later if that's okay, uh, is my kind of compromise with this. But uh, what we've done here, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the technology piece and then a little bit about uh, the human behavior piece. So we know that technology is all around us. In the preoperative setting, through um, e-visits, uh, risk uh, prediction, patient education. Uh, we know in the operating room there's decision support going on in, uh, all the time within the OR for our anesthesiology colleagues, for uh, perfusions, et cetera, um, help us decision, decide where to put patients after surgery. And then in the patient room, it's just becoming this uh, uh, smorgasbord of, uh, of wireless and Bluetooth devices that help us with surveillance, that can help us with deterioration risk, um, escalation of care, et cetera. I'm going to hone in on just one piece that we've begun to think about and work on in the post-operative setting. What's interesting, the way we collect vital signs, I heard a lot about this yesterday uh, from uh, uh, some of the folks in, in Peter's group, about how we collect vitals. We have highly trained nurses going around uh, and this is, this is just a schematic from this company, by the way. I have no interest in this company. Um, so I just, they just have a really good figure. Um, you know, where the nurse or tech or somebody has to go find a, a pole that has all the equipment on it for blood pressure and stuff. They go to the patient's room. They generally wake the patient up in the middle of the night. Um, they slap this stuff on them. They, they write down 
you guys probably have the same government issued napkins that everybody writes the vital signs on, right? Uh, that's, they write it on a little napkin, and then um, they have to uh, leave the room, in theory, clean that equipment, but if your hospital's like mine, they, they don't always do that, and then they have to enter the data somewhere, either write it on a chart or enter an EHR. This is the way we've been doing it from the days of Florence Nightingale, right? This has not changed for hundreds of years. This is the way we collect data. Why do we not employ the most uh, simple technology that's available, um, like a little, you know, like my, my Apple Watch here is monitoring my heart rate this entire talk, right? It it's soon will be able to monitor my uh, EKG. Um, we have the technology out there to have this being captured in real time and then fed into systems that can either present it to us in a more efficient manner um, or begin to run certain algorithms on it so that we go from this linear traditional healthcare model to this model where we have analytics and um, all different sorts of uh, uh, patient input. Why not have the algorithm use the patient's uh, you know, Fitbit or Apple Watch um, that had been collecting the vital signs data before we uh, operated on them and incorporate that into what should be happening to them afterwards. These are not revolutionary or uh, you know, pie in the sky ideas. Apple is doing this, they're just not telling us about it yet. Um, so we need to be on the forefront of understanding this and incorporating it into our workflow. And, and I put machine learning on, you can't talk about technology and healthcare anymore without talking about machine learning and AI. Um, those, are t those are two, uh, again, buzzwords that I will not say that I know much about. I, work, I collaborate with uh, individuals who use this and one of the major limitations for us in healthcare is it's, it's easy to build algorithms using one hospital's data, but it's only helpful for that one hospital. And the only way we're gonna achieve nirvana, so to speak, with machine learning is when we have giant data repositories of vital signs data and whatnot coming in from people all over the country and all over the world. And this is kind of the big brother piece that Apple is doing in the background, uh, because I know they're collecting my heart, they're probably wondering why is his heart beat? like 500 beats a set minute right now. Um, you know, but you know, they're collecting this data in the background and hopefully we'll have um, some ability to apply that to clinical care in the future. So let's go to the human behavior piece and um, this is actually my favorite part and of course uh, I, I didn't leave myself a ton of time to talk about it, but um, I told you about a lot of uh, secondary data analyses that we had done and one of the things that we tried to understand was these con the relative contribution of all of these different factors to understanding rescue. And uh, what we found was if you take into consideration all uh, eight of these factors, seven of these factors, it only accounts for about 30% of the variation in failure to rescue. So that means there's 70% unobserved variation, and we're not sure why uh, that 70% is occurring. And I believe it has to do, at least in part, to human behaviors, the stuff that you can't really measure in a secondary data analysis. So what we employed, and um, I would love your in insights on this, is swim lane uh, analyses, right? So have you seen these before? Yeah, uh, this is literally just on one unit, the interactions between all of these different um, uh, individuals who provide or uh, care for the patient, and how they all interact, you know, uh, all the different individuals that they interact with, how do they monitor, how do they detect complications, how do they assess patients, this is, when, I, when we did this, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm never gonna figure this out, right? This is how complicated healthcare is, but we know that there are ways for us to begin to hone in on at least little nuggets of, of these um, interactions to improve um, how we rescue patients. And ergo, the PERFECT study, right? Um, it's not perfect, my project manager uh, tells me that I chose this acronym because I'm a surgeon, and surgeons think they're perfect. Um, but uh, I said, no, there's a little, it should be an accent. It's the perfect. Idea was to perfect care, and this was our goal in, uh, or our goal was to really enhance uh, these three areas where we felt were gonna be important, engagement, communication, and teamwork in improving the rescue process. And to better understand whether these are the right constructs, uh, we visited um, five different hospitals in the state of Michigan, two that were low failure to rescue outliers, which are high quality hospitals, and three, there were high failure rescue hospitals uh, that were high outliers. And we conducted uh, semi-structured interviews with about 50 stakeholders, anywhere from surgeons to nurses to anesthetists to uh, respiratory therapists, uh, hospital administrators, et cetera. And um, we conducted a, kind of a thematic analysis uh, using consensus coding and came up with seven themes or areas where we feel uh, that, that, that we, not we, that, that our um, interviewees felt mattered the most in rescue. And here they are. By the way, 
this type of research, like all those other things, like my, my fellows could do on their laptops, this took two and a half years to do this, which was uh, exhausting. And then all I get is this one stinking slide out of it. Um, <clears throat> so, so what matters most? Um, the, the factors on the left we actually found were positive across hospitals. That um, there has been some sort of cultural uh, and societal shift where uh, there, was, there is really no fear in speaking up, the concept of psychological safety. Um, teamwork actually, to a certain degree, happens uh, fairly well once the crisis has been identified. In action taking, people rally. We found that uh, people, uh, providers felt that if there's a patient crashing, everybody rallies to that patient's uh, a, a care. Nobody's really going to turn a blind eye to that, and swift action really was taken. The stuff on the left, is, these are short for communication processes, access, tools, and recognition, were poor. Uh, kind of goes without saying, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, in a second. So here's some representative quotations from people. Uh, you know, I think uh, this, is, this was interesting. I, I, I'm very comfortable escalating. I've never thought about twice about calling. Um, and what we found was, this was a, this was a nurse. Uh, a lot of young nurses, I mean, it, this is like the new generation. Like, I, I'll call you, I'll wake you up, I don't care. Like, yeah, their patient's not doing well. Um, they're, they're, that fear factor has dissipated a little bit, um, and I think, again, that's a cultural and societal shift that we're benefiting from. The negatives, so areas that really did need some improvement in communication recognition. So um, this, is, this really resonated with me. They kind of blow you off when I think, no, there's really something going on. Now, that makes it sound like uh, people aren't listening to them, but the question here is, are they blowing you off because... Maybe you didn't communicate the right information, and, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, here, you know, uh, identification could be better. Consistently, people said, once we knew the problem, it was kind of obvious, right? Like, okay, so the patient's in septic shock, we know what to do. Question was, could you, could you identify that sepsis before it led to shock? Um, and that's where identification could be better. And so uh, we re revised this a little bit, and we, we uh, rec um, recognized that it's, it's about recognition and effectively communicating early signs of deterioration that are going to lead to this rescue. Again, some of this seems like almost like common sense, but um, it's, a, it's a, a critical to hear this from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And so uh, what this led us to, to begin to talk about is how do you know when to escalate and how to escalate? We don't want people to uh, you know, be the boy who cried wolf, right? To constantly escalate care unnecessarily and then begin, you know, at the end of the day, no one's going to listen to you. And in talking to our frontline providers, what we learned is that the majority are novices, right? So um, I see a lot of young faces on this side. Are, are you all like house officers, trainees, students? Yeah, okay, great. So, uh, uh, so, so, so you, I think we heard this yesterday, will one day wake up the night before you were a student the next day, you're a full-fledged doctor who can prescribe whatever you want. Nothing changes when you're asleep. You're the same person with the same inexperience. Uh, but yet one day you wake up and you're managing some of the most critically ill patients in our hospital. Kind of scary, right? Engineers cringe at that. So what can we do to improve or shore up your experience? And I think it gets to this, I call the three C's of communication here. So competence is key. And that doesn't mean that you're incompetent. It just means that your competence level isn't up to the level of someone who's been in practice for 20 years and cared for thousands of patients and had this kind of immersive experience. And so how do we improve and, and, and uh, speed that process up? Competence leads to confidence, right? Um, you know, here's, a, here's a great uh, quote from Jim Rohn. Effective communication is 20% what you know and 80% 80, 80 how you feel about what you know, right? So that quotation earlier where they said, you know, I called and they kind of blew me off. Well, it depends how, uh, I don't want to say forceful, but how convincing you were that there's a problem. If it was just a hunch, then uh, that, that, may, that may not have um, uh, resulted in the response that you want. All right, I saw you look at your watch. I'm going to speed up in a second. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> so what we did is we went to the, we went again to our frontline providers. We held this rescue innovation event. I would encourage you to try one of these if you haven't. I think you guys may have done stuff like this where we got all the stakeholders together, we presented them with a lot of the data I just showed you, and we let them come up with the solutions. And here's what's insane. They came up with this early communication system, this four-pronged approach. 
that actually fits into human factors kind of thinking without them even being human factors experts. And the four-pronged approach is these clinical pathways, trend recognition, video-based complication training, and then simulation-based practice. And the idea here is these all build on one another. Clinical pathways, establishing an understanding of normal. You, when you hit the wards, may have seen a couple patients who had a Whipple operation, right? Whipple patients are not normal post-op. You've just, like, there's this major physiologic insult. A normal Whipple patient is not a patient with, the same as a patient with pneumonia. For you to understand what normal looks like, you need to have some guidance, some sort of expected post-op course. And we've developed these for multiple operations now uh, with the input of our surgeons and nurses to kind of say, what are some general milestones? This is not an order set. This is not something that you just kind of check boxes on. What this does and what our uh, trainees are using this now and our nurses find it helpful is it allows them to have a more meaningful conversation uh, with the attending surgeon or the care team. Hey, you know what? It's day three and they're still got an NG tube in. What's going on? It's just, it's just a simple question. Oh, well, you know, they've got gastroparesis and we're dealing with that. Oh, is there anything I should be worried about? Yep, you should definitely make sure head of bed is up because you, you know, there are aspiration risk and both. You know, it sparks a conversation that would have not happened otherwise. So again, now these are the expected post-op courses. Uh, trend recognition, this is my favorite right now. This is the one we're working on. It's to begin to understand what does abnormal look like and what can you do about it. Um, and uh, what we've done to teach this is this concept of rescue improvement conferences. We do these once a month. They're a modification of our typical M&M conference, which I think is really an untapped resource. Do you guys have weekly or monthly M&Ms here? Yeah, I think it's, we, we do it the same way we did it 100 years ago today. Um, and what we've done is try to flip it on its head. And this is the patient I was describing to you earlier, the very beginning of the talk. This is what happened. So the patient, they come in to intubate the patient. They give their you know, normal induction doses. The patient goes into cardiac arrest. Um, and they do two rounds of chest compression. They got the patient back, but he ultimately succumbed the day after. Again, they were going in to do a routine procedure, but what went wrong? So in a typical m and we would talk about, oh, well, you know, it's a frail old man. And, had a complication, and they ask the attending, would you do anything differently? They always say, no, I don't know, we've done the same thing, right? Sound familiar? Yeah, so you're not allowed to say that in this conference. You can never say I would do the same thing, because then I'd say then every patient's gonna die if you keep doing the same thing. So, uh, so we have this case analysis checklist that we've modified from the Ottawa model. And uh, what we do is our, our, we have our house officers are the ones who present, and they basically go through and identify all the different issues with that case, uh, thinking about it from a more systems and cognitive perspective. And what do they do with these? They then have to come up with key concepts for rescue improvement. How, what, were the, what were the critical fails in each of these arenas? And in this case, there was an overconfidence on the, on the part of the uh, anesthetic team that came up to intubate. Um, there was a skill set error, and this led to an institutional change from this conference um, about resuscitating before you intubate, even in an elective setting in the, in the, in the hospital. And there was a um, critical teamwork failure when the anesthesia team came up to intubate, I didn't tell you this, the critical care team was rounding on the opposite end of the intensive care unit. There was zero discussion between these two sets of providers on this very critically ill patient. Had they asked that team, the critical care team, they said, oh, he's been kind of dwindling. Uh, you know, He's a lot sicker than he looks like on paper, which is what, how we talked about. And so um, I'm going to skip over that. This became policy. We uh, this became a new policy in our hospital on how we in electively intubate patients in the hospital. This came out of a simple M&M &M conference. When's the last time an M&M changed policy in the hospital? At least in our, at our M&M, never. I easily could say never. Um, and here are the systems issues. I'm, I'm going to skip over that. The last couple pieces will go quickly because we only have four minutes left. Um, Video-based complication training. This is in early stages of development. I liken this to kind of your choose your own adventure. It's going to be fun. You guys are going to love it. Um, it's uh, basically kind of interactive videos, uh, like whiteboard type videos, where um, you're presented with a case like that patient, and there's no wrong answer, but you pick what, what do you want to do next, and it takes you down a path. And what this really helps you do is you can take the perspective of other providers. So hey, you're going to be the nurse in this situation. You're going to have to make these critical decisions. Here's what happens when you uh, make that decision. Patients don't just die. Uh, it might lead to a prolonged hospital course, et cetera. I took this straight out of aviation. They do this for all their credentialing and recredentialing. They do these choose your own adventure simulations, which are amazing. And simulation-based practice, 
Uh, I think this is, again, probably a little bit of a unicorn, but I think that we are going to work toward it. Uh, the, the hardest thing here is really identifying time and space to do this. But this is about building muscle memory, having the same people around you, the same environment, the same sights, the same smells um, when you're trying to manage uh, patients. And I think uh, uh, it'll be very important um, as, as kind of one of the, the ultimate steps. So I hope I uh, encouraged you uh, to think more about communication. It is not as simple as a, a unidirectional um, uh, idea. And I will close the last couple of slides. Now these are just kind of froofy slides, right? So I'm from Michigan. If you haven't heard about the team, the team, the team, uh, that's a, a mantra from Bo Schembechler. I'd encourage you to Google that and listen to him give this speech to the football team many years ago um, in emphasizing it's not about one person. It's about the team, the team, the team. And uh, we live by this at Michigan. It's, it, this is a, the tunnel going down to uh, the football uh, uh, stadium. This is my team, 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 uh, uh, folks across three institutions um, that have really been uh, integral. Again, a very uh, interprofessional group. We've got you know, folks in the business school. We've got anesthesiologists, uh, uh, nursing directors, nursing, nursing, a surgeon, project managers, residents, anesthesiologists. We've got people from all, all spectrum, and these are systems engineers. So this is my other team. They're the ones who let me come uh, here. Uh, sorry, I know, Dr. Hamdi, I'm almost done, I swear. Um, but I, uh, I, I, I used to incorporate that much more in my talk, but I was told to stop talking about my family. So, um, <laughs> but these are my four children, uh, Cameron, Ryan, Sean, and Lila. Uh, and that's my original son, uh, Dodger, who is still alive at well in thir at 13, and I would argue one of the most beautiful dogs on the planet. This is the matriarch of the family who is also a full-time practicing physician and uh, really kind of holds uh, the group together. Um, and uh, again, it would not be, none of this work would be possible without this group. That's it.